Well, thanks everyone for allowing me to come and talk with you all today. I apologise in advance because I'm quite passionate about this and sometimes my passion gets a little bit over the top. However, my goal for this entire presentation today is to make you as passionate about something as simple as venous access in children. Um, the reason why is because this is a moment that you can make a significant impact for this child's life by doing something that can be relatively simple. This is a time for you to demonstrate your very clever brains, because I know that everybody in this room, if you've got to this stage in your career, you have those clever brains. It's an opportunity for you to demonstrate your expertise, and it's something that I know the patients and families will thank you for forever. Oh, I meant to go back. Okay, so this is a trigger warning. Okay, so for those who have done a residency that has involved an emergency placement maybe a little bit too soon and you've had to go and you've been told to go in and um, put in an IV into that one-year-old and you walk in and you find this. Okay. <laughs> that is comforting to no one, is it? You just sit there and you think, oh... <laughs> Babies like this are designed to blow raspberries on, aren't they? They're not designed for pin cushions. Um, I'd love it. So there is a whole thing on Twitter you have to get into where people are comparing their baby's arms to bread rolls and you'll never regret losing that time. Okay, great investment in time. Okay, so you have to insert a cannula into this baby. Uh, we've got a few things going on here, don't we? We're not going to be able to see anything, that's for sure. We're probably not going to be able to palpate anything. Um, this kid is l unlikely to stay still when asked to. And you've got loving family members watching you. Okay, so that's something that possibly adult uh, carers don't understand and adult medicine might not understand. These parents that they're watching, aren't they? Um, so uh, we are fearful. We're fearful with good reason. We're fearful because of our previous experience, but we're also fearful because we understand that we may do some harm here. So we don't... There's a reason for our fear, and it's well-founded. There is a reason for this child's fear as well, isn't it? So this is our... So uh, peripheral intravenous catheterization is our most common procedure we undertake in healthcare facility. Each year, there are 2 billion peripheral IV catheters sold worldwide. This is a very common procedure. We, our success rates of peripheral intravenous cannulation in paediatrics are around about 60% in our well children. Okay, so they're the children that come in that might need um, uh, some, might have their tonsils, getting their tonsils out, so this is our 60%. And then we have our difficult intravenous access patients, which we like to call divas. Everybody has a diva in their population. Um, we know that they look like they have about a 30% success of first-time attempt of getting the cannula in as being successful. Um, this procedure could take 30 seconds, it could take five minutes, it could take five hours, it could take two days. Their fear associated with that needle is well-founded and it is the thing that they most commonly, this is the patient, this is the child, this is the parent, this is their loved one, this is what they remember Two days later, after coming into your emergency, this is the thing that they remember two years later after going home from emergency. So this fear sticks with them. And sometimes we get so happy that we get that catheter in, we sometimes celebrate, I think, just a moment too prematurely, don't we? So there, this is an indication of stress, isn't it? So where we have managed to get that cannula in is normally about desperation. So it's not that we want to put the cannula in the tip of that knuckle, but we have felt like we needed to. Any child I see with a cannula in the wrist has shown me that there's some clinicians have had some very, very bad days. Um, any mobile child who's going to walk around and wear tracksuit pants, sorry, um, and has a cannula in that ankle, I know there's other clinicians who have also had a bad day. However, getting that cannula in that precarious spot has just moved the problem, hasn't it? It's moved the problem to another clinician. It has not moved the problem to a different patient. That patient is still needing that treatment when that cannula fails, when that cannula gets accidentally dislodged, when it gets occluded, when it gets infiltrated, uh, when it gets infected. So moving the problem isn't what we need to do in this situation. Instead, we need to improve our expertise, don't we? This is a moment for us that we can demonstrate our expertise, our intelligence, 
but also our resilience, our personality. This is a moment that we can demonstrate, that we can take that, we can step back, um, assess our own clinical expertise in this moment and decide if we're the one today to attempt this insertion. And then, of course, that's just peripheral intravenous access on well children. Let's talk about the real patients in our tertiary paediatric healthcare facility. These are children, there are so many patients in our hospitals that are vascular access dependent for a large proportion of their life. They have complex chronic health conditions. So let's start with somebody who I'm sure will be familiar to you, somebody called Ethan, who at 28 weeks, let's say born 28 weeks, very quickly gets neck, gets a lot of gut resection, and then needs to be TPN dependent maybe for the rest of his life. We don't know when modern technology is going to fix some of these things for us. But now he's 10 years old, and he's had 21 central lines. That is real. That is happening in a tertiary paediatric healthcare facility. In my, I'd like to say I'm 25, but I'm not quite... In my clinical life, I have seen a child die because they've run out of venous access because of their TPN dependency. So for Ethan, he's had 21 central lines. He's had numerous peripheral lines that have to be inserted while he has waited for his new central line. This is his vascular access-related harm has become his major medical condition. The obstruction of his central vessels, his central line-associated bloodstream infections, his occluded lines, that has meant that he can't get his nutrition when he actually needs it, and now he is not growing the way which he is meant to be growing. So his vascular access-dependent harm is causing him significant um, disruptions to treatment. Now, Ethan isn't the only one in our healthcare system. We, of course, have Absidy, who needs treatment, uh, needs a chest uh, optimization for her cystic fibrosis. We have Nevea. Um, who needs to receive her immunoglobulins. Um, we have Daxon with two Xs, um, who also needs treatment. Um, who may need a heart transplant in the future, but we're not really quite sure, but we definitely need to take care of his vessels and talk to some of their parents about their names in the future. <laughs> the parents, though. So let's remember that for these complex conditions, I think we've already spoken about this in this session and beyond, we have an expert at the bedside, um, for these complex chronic health uh, vascular access dependent conditions, they are vascular access experts. They know what vessels have been used before. They know it better than our IMR does in Queensland Health, that's for sure, because no one can find any of that documentation. Um, they understand it. They understand that um, uh, the, the blue lumen doesn't aspirate well unless you get them to cough. Um, they can tell you that um, if you pop a pick in that child, they will rip it out no matter what you do. So take the time to talk to the parent before you start problem solving any vascular access condition with this population specifically. So I am here today to talk about the very useful crew. So at Lady Salento Children's Hospital, I get to feel smug because we have a vascular access management service that is led by the only paediatric nurse practitioner in vascular access. No, you may not employ her. Um, <laughs> I have hidden her and put her on a plane to Darwin, actually, so she could not meet with you all today. Um, <laughs> she gets a lot of job offers. Okay, however, um, we have clinicians that have all come together um, because we really do care about vascular access, um, and they have put together what this information entails, which is the tips that we can give you to optimise your PIVC insertion, just a few top tips, as well as the CVAD problems that you're going to come across very frequently. Um, I'm not going to call, turn you into a guru by the end, but I'm hoping to give you some really useful tips that you can move forward with, as well as that recognition of why you need to take the time for this. So if you need to insert a peripheral IV catheter, there are so many things that are going to make this procedure successful or not successful. The number one thing is you, of course. You may not be the person to insert that device at that moment. I'm sorry to break it to you, but you may not be at the best, you may not be the best peripheral IV catheter inserter today, and you shouldn't possibly be practicing on that patient at the end of your 12 hour shift on your seventh day in a row. You need to be able to assess the patient as to how hard they will be to cannulate, how many uh, palpable vessels do they have, 
Um, how many visible vessels do they have? Preventing yourself from making the only attempt, that, you know, the attempt on the only visible vessel at the end of that seven-day stretch may be the best thing you could do for that patient. That does mean you have to admit imperfection, which may be very difficult for A-type personalities, but I know you can do it. You've learnt to do it with other things. Um, but at least taking that time, so there's a lot of work been done on Gestalt, and Gestalt has definitely been demonstrated here, that if you don't feel that there's an 80% chance that you're going to get that peripheral IV catheter in, then you probably won't. So you need to assess yourself in harmony with that patient and make that call. You also need to make sure that you're inserting the right device. So in an urgent situation, there is nothing wrong with an IO as long as it is clinically indicated and they're going to get the treatment they need. There are also a lot of infusates that are really possibly not peripheral IV catheter um, appropriate. Um, and we need to look at the appropriateness of the therapy and the duration of the therapy that you want that to be administered for. There is a great use of mid, uh, you know, the great cannula of a midline, which means that now we're inserting a cannula that the tip finishes at the axilla, where now we've got such better flow rates and we might be able to get that vancomycin administered for the next five days. If you're inserting a precarious line on the hand, that vancomycin therapy is not going to be completed. You're going to insert multiple devices. So taking the time to ensure the infusate and the treatment duration is appropriate to the device that you're choosing to insert is very important here. Ultrasound is awesome. Boron vessels are awesome. Now, they're both awesome for very different things. We have randomised control trials that has demonstrated that specifically in that difficult, the diva patient, I want you all calling them divas from now on, I feel like it's my goal. Um, in the diva patient, ultrasound really does provide significant benefits for that first time insertion success. So the idea that the first time you attempt, once you become competent, it will improve your success rates dramatically. When I talk about ultrasound, I don't mean using ultrasound as a screening tool to identify the vessel, throw it away and then insert. Like you can see in this picture, so this is Trisha, that clever person you can't employ. Um, uh, she is looking at the ultrasound machine. She is not looking at where she is inserting. This is using true ultrasound guidance for the entire insertion procedure, not for assessment of that vessel. The other thing that really comes in package with the ultrasound is the ability to get great vessels. So forearm vessels are fantastic. They've got a higher flow rate going through them. They're bigger vessels. Um, they come with a natural arm board. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and nobody's been there before you. Because you can't palpate them easily, you can't see them very, you can't see them, that means that when you're coming to, to assess that diva, there's a very good chance that no one has attempted there before. So they're not blown. You have to have a conversation with your clinicians who are uh, put on your EMLA or whatever you're using to help um, uh, decrease pain, so if it's the methacaine or EMLA, because, of course, you'll turn up to insert that IV and there'll be one, 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 and then you go, but I want to go here. So there are other technologies available and you need to do this within your team, but forearm vessels are great if you have the skills to use them. Of course, this is a learning curve situation, the first time you pick up the ultrasound to insert the peripheral IV catheter, you probably are going to suck. I'm sorry. It's a learnt skill. Um, and where you sit on this learning curve, I can't tell you. I can tell you that I'm actually not very good at this skill. I can accept that, um, and I do things like this instead. Um, but you may be the green line, and it might take you a lot of practice before you get to the top, or let's just hope you're the blue but you need to practice. Repetition helps here. You shouldn't be picking up your ultrasound once every six months and wondering why you're no good at it when you go to use it. It's a frequency-based um, skill. <laughs> Isn't that the cutest burrito ever? Okay. Um, this was better than the real slides when you actually... A super burrito wrap is great. Hopefully you remember to leave an arm out to insert the cannula here. Um, but taking the time to optimise the insertion procedure is really valuable. So you should be ensuring... So we use a super burrito wrap on up to a six-year-old. Anyone that you feel like you really, really can't... Um, that you can't trust in any way. So, that, so, so a super burrito wrap, meaning you wrap everything except for the arm, which you're going to have, um, secure, you're going to have assistance with. A lot of conversations need to be made about this complex um, procedure. 
there's a discussion about the moment of insertion to completion doesn't finish until the dressing is in, in place. You do not celebrate that you've got the PIVC in. Um, you need to make sure that when you're setting up your PIVC insertion moment, you look at your ergonomics. You ensure that the ultrasound is where you're looking, so straight ahead, not to the side. You need to make sure that, um, so most of the people who are really successful will really sit down because then they know that they're less likely to do this during a procedure. This is something that when you take the ergonomics and think about where you even place your cannula and your administration, so your three-way extension kit, for example, take the time to set that up well. You will never regret doing that really, really well. Also look to see how you dress and secure these devices. That moment of celebration should be followed by careful procedure. So this is a technology that we've been using at the Children's Hospital. We've also been studying in very large randomised controlled trials. It's something you can find non-sterily at Bunnings. Um, so medical grade super glue. And as you can see, we've put one drop at the insertion site and one drop directly underneath the hub. And isn't that nice? That's our project manager. Who wants a job with us? Um, <laughs> so uh, the idea is that you do then ensure that you properly dress and secure this peripheral IV catheter. This is just one part of your more complex dressing and securement bundle for our peripheral IV catheters. However, it is definitely, um, so we did have um, a trial published in the, trans, in the small journal known as The Lancet two weeks ago, where we did this on um, adult medical surgical patients. We've uh, just finished 330 participant trial at Lady Salento. It does look like super glue can be an effective part of your overall PIV securement bundle. However, you don't want to remove this an hour later because it's super glue, yeah? You also, it's expensive. Each one of these little applicator costs about $9. So for your child who's coming in and needs a cannula for six hours, you wouldn't be applying it. But for the child that everyone has had five attempts or you know is going to be difficult, invest in dressing and securing this device well. This is the indication, the diva population. And I would say there's a lot of divas in the room and there's a lot of divas in our hospitals that I would be very happy to invest this $9 on because nobody wants to come to put that new device on it in at 2 a.m. So this is our other big population and I'll get through this as quickly as I can. I thought I was going to be quicker than this. So central lines. Um, central lines are associated with harm as well as benefit. This, a lot of this is because of the population that require them. We did a meta-analysis not so long ago and did demonstrate that one in four central lines stop working before treatment's completed, and that is terrible. We talk about reliability in healthcare. One in four failure for a, a very necessary device is just horrific. We spend a lot of time worrying about bloodstream infection. However, the our most common complications that we see in Australia, this was an Australian-wide audit we did across all paediatric tertiary facilities about two years ago, and of course, the complications that we saw were most commonly blockage. Central lines get blocked. They're tubes, they're pipes. It's going to happen. But what we do is very quickly go to a thrombotic occlusion, let's give some urokinase and let's move on. Yay, I fixed it! When realistically, there are a lot of other things that can be resulting in catheter occlusion in this population, and most commonly, it's actually going to be a mechanical-based occlusion. So taking the time to problem-solve um, what could be going on mechanically that is causing this. We also have a lot of infused in occlusions that we're very quickly ignoring. So that is um, when we have delivered medications that aren't compatible. We might see this when patients come back from theatre and they've been given propofol, so a lipid that hasn't been flushed well and then other treatment commenced afterwards. So taking the time to problem solve all of the things that have resulted in occlusion is really important. Ensuring that we have proper catheter tip positioning if we have the catheter too high, it's always going to get occluded. And you're going to have to wake up that oncology kid to get their bloods at 2 a.m. Um, in order to get them to do some star jumps in order to make it start functioning again. So let's take the time that when you insert the catheter, so you may not be the inserter, but you are the person that um, can check the x-ray when they've come back to make sure it isn't too high. It's a lot easier to fix quickly than it is a month later. This is what we're afraid of. I'm very much afraid of this as well. This is from our old PICU at the Royal Children's in Brisbane. Um, and so this is catheter-associated blood from infection. They're now busy getting treatment for multi-organ dysfunction in comparison to cancer. So what we have done is we've started to remove blood from infection, uh, anyone at risk of blood from infection, any sign, any sign of febrile um, illness, um, any temporary device will take out that device really quickly. 
However, we did do a meta-analysis very recently and we found that 17% of CVADs in ICU, so those temporary CVADs, are removed because people think they're infected. However, only 4% of them actually are infected. So taking the time to properly diagnose is very important here. I could do a whole talk on how to prevent CLABSI and I think everybody has spent a lot of time worrying about that. But what we haven't thought about is this. So this is a... Uh, no one believes the p-values like that. However, we should worry about what this looks overall. So this is um, what a, uh, treatment delays look like in pa uh, paediatric patients with cancer. So these are kids that are getting treated for ALL and AML. And this line are the patients that their central line function for their entire treatment. This is the one where their treatment was delayed because their line no longer worked and they had to either get a replacement or it had to be significantly problem solved. And five years later, we're seeing a 30% a difference in survival. So quickly removing these lines or not properly um, managing their occlusions is causing these guys um, a lot of problems moving forward. A really common complication, especially with PICS, is the risk of thrombosis, of course. But yet our chest, and I really commonly get the whole, we've got, a, we've got a pick, we've got thrombus around the pick, I'm going to remove the pick. No, 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 uh, no. Um, uh, chest guidelines tell us that we can safely leave the pick in most of the time and just treat the thrombosis, don't treat the pick. You're probably going to get a thrombus on the next pick you put in. CVAD associated skin impairment is endemic in our population and we rarely think about it. We need to look at how we prevent dermatitis related injuries as well as mechanical injuries. You have pop, uh, central lines are popping all over the place. Here your role is to be understand the procedure of how to change um, a, a, a broken CVAD. So that's most commonly those silicone tunnel cuff central lines. Remembering that your role may be to insert the peripheral IV catheter so they can get antibiotic cover. This is our long-term goal. We want our babies to grow up and grow beards. We want them to do that with a vasculature that is intact enough that they can receive the treatment they may need for their cancer when they're 60. They, also may st they will still, if they have cystic fibrosis, be receiving some form of treatment. So making sure that we're looking at that long-term va vessel health and preservation is just so important. So those small decisions you're making about these devices have long-term consequences. The way, of course, that we have integrated this into our local healthcare system is worship of our nurse practitioner <laughs> and respecting every single decision that she makes. Um, this may not be feasible forever um, by everyone. Um, however, at least having the respect that you all now have for this device is an important part of that pathway. And I'm hoping this little video will work and demonstrate to you why we think it's so important. time, everyone. Thank you very much for that. There's quite a few questions on Twitter, so I think we should go directly onto that. I think you've really tapped a vein on Twitter. Ah, uh, she's here all day. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a whole lot of fans of bread roll or baby arm now. <laughs> but um, a couple of questions. So from Kath Woodfield, um, my then eight-month-old daughter had intranasal midazolam for a cannula before an MRI in a consult room. This was in Canada. Um, and she says it was fabulous. Why can't we do this more in the everyday? Mm. So I think the use of procedural sedation for this population is something we really need to look at improving. But that involves a real prioritisation of vascular access within your healthcare system. You need safety here, of course. You need, um, uh, you need anaesthetic um, buy-in here. 
Um, we did do a vascular access workshop just a couple of days ago and my, our paediatric intensivist said you needed to sedate everyone, but he's an intensivist, so that makes sense. He can do that. I think he suggested chloral as his indicator. Mm. At least, at a very least, we need to make sure we're providing some form of localised anaesthetic and that's something that we don't do that routinely. Um, so I think that the use of more modern um, procedures, um, so the idea of something like midazolam would be fabulous and I'd love to see someone try how that works in our really complex health system. Um, there was a couple of questions around um, the statement about you might not be the best person to put a vein in. So um, Laura Stevens asks, any advice for those of us admitting imperfection and recognising we aren't the best for that um, IVC to convince our bosses and our anaesthetics while we haven't had a go? And Annika Berglund adds to that with, I've been a junior doctor in the ED that has suggested this and been told you won't get it if you don't try. So how do we change this culture? Oh, cultural change, you want me to fix that in one minute and under? <laughs> okay, so I demonstrate, my first um, argument to them would be, we have one vessel left, do you want me to try or do you think you should? So you, uh, they don't want to come and have a patient who's been butchered by the person who preceded them. So as long as you've done a good assessment of the patient and your skill, then you're coming to them with information regarding why. So if you're going to them with the information of why is because, oh, I can't be bothered, that's a different conversation to, we have one vessel left in the forearm, it needs ultrasound and I'm not competent yet. That's a conversation that an anaesthetist, that an intensivist, whoever is your escalation pathway should respect. But you need to have an escalation pathway. We have, of course, uh, done a lot of work on that in paediatrics over the last little while. There's been some surveys going out and the escalation pathways aren't formalised and not well resourced. So there needs to be a health service that supports some of this as well. And um, Suzanne Royals just sort of added to that about um, a use of appropriate language hypnosis and um, other non-pharmacological Absolutely, means. yeah. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of questions around the glue for securing the IVC. So specifically, um, how long does the glue last for and how do you remove it? And is it the same as the sterile glue that we use to... Yeah. Um, fix lacerations. Yeah, so not to say brand names, of course, but so medical grade superglues, you've already got some hidden in your ED for your lacerations and for your umbilical hernias, they're hiding all over the place. And it is the same, um, same um, glue. Um, so uh, the importance here is less is more. So as you can see in that video, there was one or two, there was one drop at the insertion site and one drop under the hub. We're not flooding. We did a lot of work on this in jugular lines around men with beards, and if you want to break a man with a beard, put a whole lot of superglue near it, that will make him cry, not the cardiac procedure. Um, so uh, when it comes to the application, the way you apply it will help you remove it. It lasts around two to three days, sometimes three to four days, and you'll find there's just a powder underneath that dressing once it starts to dissolve. It will dissolve from the skin, it won't dissolve from the plastic. Plastic and glue forever friends. Um, so uh, you need to ensure that you are still using good dressing and securement over the top. This is an adjunctive. But I think if we're using this, indicating this for our divas, if we can get one peripheral IV to last three days, we're pretty chuffed. So um, that's why uh, using it in that, in that moment is where it's really valuable. Removing it, you use a really complex product called Remove. Um, <laughs> Yeah, or so that's a chemical-based um, adhesive removal product, or you can use simple paraffin. So the paraffin will slide underneath the skin, underneath that glue really easily. I would not be applying it on patients with impaired skin. So if you've got eczema around the site, you're going, it's another chemical on that skin. Um, however, healthy skin, which is where you should be inserting your peripheral IVs, it will work really well. We also use it in ticks to help promote hemostasis at that insertion site. You think of those patients that... Um, so uh, a coagulopathic and needing a pick, providing one or two drops right on the insertion site, you'll get that instant hemostasis because it's a plug. Um, and then when they wake up, the hemostasis that you've managed to um, get under general anaesthetic will continue when they're conscious. So that's nice. Okay. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. I don't know if there's anyone on the floor who wants to ask a question. The dogma surrounding the routine change mm. of peripheral artery hemorrhage. I, um, I was just wondering how you manage some of the dogma surrounding um, routine changes of peripheral artery cannulas on your ward. Yeah, so we are, are pretty lucky. 
our hospital never did routine change. Um, however, I, involved, I was involved in the big randomised control trial where they did um, uh, look at routine change in adult patients and we've seen now the, um, how that slid back to our, uh, our paediatric hospital. So they think that in order to prevent infection, we need to routinely replace our IVs every three days, four days. Um, we haven't seen in any large trials that they do prevent infection, uh, that routine replacement, but we definitely know that um, more and more insertions will definitely harm our patients, especially for our patients with difficult IV access. Um, it hasn't been a challenge for us locally because we haven't had to do it. However, it's a huge problem within our adult populations about implementing that. And I respect the infectious diseases physician's perspective that pieces of plastic should get biofilm on them the longer, they're, uh, the longer they're in, the higher risk of biofilm causing a real infection. However, we've never seen that happen in the thousands of... So we've recruited 10,000 patients to some of our trials and they're yet to see a blood from infection rate that increases by anything. So um, evidence has been one of our way of doing it. Illustration of patient harm associated with multiple PIVs has been the other argument. Uh, I've seen many infants and children where there have been so many IV attempts mm. and I've said, why don't you just give one or two injections of intramuscular injections a day, save antibiotics for five days. I think there's less morbidity. Mm. You go down that route at all? No, we haven't done anything on that, but I'm, we're doing a lot on the, at the moment about the, what is the true appropriateness of these type of therapies in paediatric healthcare. And I think that's something that we should better understand is when, at what stage do we give up on trying to get that peripheral IV in and give that IM injection of keftriaxone that may get them to the end of their therapy? Um, that needs to be also a treatment-based decision that depends on the underlying pathology of what we're treating there. And I think most people in this room probably have a specific belief about when that should happen. But we need to be pragmatic in our health services that we may not be able to get the peripheral IV in. So what's going to cause more harm? Is it going to be them not getting any antibiotic dose for 12 hours until somebody can insert a PIC or another type of device? Or the fact that they're going to get IM keftriaxone? And I think I know where I would want my child to be on that. OK, we'll have one last question before we lunch. Uh, we ought to comment on um, systematic uh, responses to the 12 attempts mm. in, in ED. Oh, by yeah. Can you come and help us now? I know that there is, you know, two two attempts each, but by the time you had six people have their two attempts, it gets kind of nuts. Mm. How did you go systematically to change that culture? Yeah, so we're trying to do some work on um, being able to identify the patients who are going to be difficult before you, you know, poke them with a needle. Um, so there are some diva tools around that have been put together on really high quality data sets within Australia. So having that available in your ED so that people are able to identify them before the IV attempt is made is step one. Then understanding who's truly competent. Just because you have a job title doesn't mean you're very good at something. So you need to be able to put your hand up and say, yeah, my current rate, my IV cannula success rate is currently 90%. I'm bloody awesome. So you get to be the referral. It could be that there's an, a talented intern in your ED that should be the person that you refer to rather than the person who has the job title. So taking some time to um, ensure that you understand who you're escalating to at the right time is the next step, I would say. But understanding it, it requires data. So um, we often don't, we, we have very little record on peripheral IV cannulation attempts in our, in our hospitals. So having some information about including that as a gold standard of your patient care with an ED that's auditable and trackable, I think is really useful here and helps generate those system changes. Is there a system anywhere of what constitutes a diva, bread roll arm thickness or something like that? <laughs> the important thing is that who is a diva today may not be a diva tomorrow. You don't get to keep diva cate categorizations for the rest of your life. Um, and so there is some great work by um, Hallam and colleagues in the UK. And theirs has always been about your ability to visualize and palpate the vessels. That's actually the indication. Do you have one vessel available? Do you have 10 vessels available? Do you have none? And that's the indication of who should have that first attempt. It's also the indication to image you. So that's your indication for ultrasound. Please join me in thanking our brilliant speakers. <laughs>